it's summer and my husband is ill. My days consist of driving a half an hour each way to work and my evenings of driving an hour each way to the hospital. During these rides, when I eat breakfast and supper in the car, I begin to tell myself a story in which our dog and I drive west. We live in Clawverk, centrally located in the middle of nowhere, Dan says. Now Dan's illness is terminal. And as I drive and drive, I imagine a meandering route across the country for the dog and me. We stay with friends in Chicago and Colorado Springs and Albuquerque. The other nights, we stay in Holiday Inns because they take dogs and they have swimming pools. We proceed slowly because we have finally no obligations, no appointments. We drive right to the Pacific and stand at the water. The dog bats at things in puddles and I gaze out at the horizon. After a few minutes of this, we look at each other, the dog and I, and I ask her, so what do you wanna do now? A friend takes me out for lunch during that terrible summer and I tell her this story. Fantasies are important, she says, and I think, no, no, it's real. Dan dies that August, several years ago. We'd been together for 25 years, but I had lived alone before him, and now I again became a team of one. I wrote a blog, Two Becomes One, Widowhood for the Rest of Us. And there I developed an essay, 10 Scary Things I Have Done Since My Husband Died. This list was called from the 100 or 110 scary things I actually did. It began with 10, the least scary, and worked up to one, the scariest. So, beginning with number 10. I got up the next morning after Dan died, and in this way accepted my grief. I asked for help learning to risk the humiliation of refusal. Staring down the specter of scarcity, I paid for help. And slowly, my home looked cared for again and loved. I traveled by myself to the West Coast, of course, to Seattle and San Diego, but also to Japan and China and Russia, places I had dreamed of seeing. I hosted a dinner party all by myself. And I put down his dog because we had two dogs and Dan's was the older one, the one I had hoped would become the oldest dog in our Basenji club until I realized I wasn't doing either of us any favors. He died in my arms at twice Dan's age in dog years. I became a lay Eucharistic reader at my church, which proved to be not so much a performance as learning a new language, moving over the months from inarticulate to hearing my mistakes as I made them to communicating. I learned to use the gas mower with its need for a poisonous, flammable chemical, the scariest thing in the shed. I dealt with the snake in the bathroom. And I sold the house that we had shared and moved west, 13 miles to Hudson. The dog who would have driven to the Pacific with me grew old and died. And after a while, I got another dog, adopted a nine-year-old with the attitude of an adolescent and the name of Sizzle. Flash forward to June 2018, another raw, windy day in Hudson. The air should be mild and sweet with the scent of roses and the promise of outdoor swimming. Instead, the damp cold seeps through my jacket and the scent recalls not so much the grass beach at the pond, but a stormy sea tossing my ship. 
after a brutal winter, a winter so cold and windy I forgot to go snowshoeing. The spring brings no relief, just acute allergies. On that June day, I'm walking home from CVS, having scored yet another over-the-counter medication that might help. I'm wearing that jacket and a hat, a scarf around my neck, socks on my feet, and I am freezing. I'm freezing and I'm thinking, I can't take this anymore. Arriving home, I greet Sizzle and walk upstairs to my computer. I Google San Diego condominium, $250,000. And what a sweet place Google shows me. Swimming pool, patio, carport. I try to be skeptical. I look at each photo twice. I read the description carefully, trying to read between the lines. Then I send the link to my friend Tamara in San Diego. She knows everything. Is this in a bad neighborhood, I ask? She replies within the hour. Not a bad neighborhood, she says, but it's near Rose Creek, so it could be stinky sometimes. Here, try this one. And she attaches a link for another condo, even sweeter, at $250,000. Swimming pool, balcony, garage. And I think, I can do this. I think, there's no rule that says you have to suffer this stupid weather. And I think, I have time for one more adventure. Moving west started when I told myself I couldn't do it. I didn't have enough money. Or if I did have enough money, it was because I had a good job here with witty coworkers. And if I went out there, what would I do? Or my parents were too old to leave. And then after they died in their 90s, I was too old for such a big move. But moving west had stayed in my head and my heart since I had comforted myself with a road trip story years before. It wasn't a fantasy, it was a dream. In February of 2019, Sizzle and I left Hudson in sub-zero temperatures. I had sold my house and bought a condo in San Diego. I had given away 22 cartons of books and 95 t-shirts. We drove west, Sizzle and I, across the Rip Van Winkle Bridge. Sizzle tucked into her crate, Debbie clutching the wheel, two winter storms behind us. People would say, oh, go to this museum or that national park. And I would think, honey, I have an 11-year-old dog in the car and it's 11 degrees outside. I drive. I hate to drive, did I tell you? Mm. It's at the same time, boring and stressful, which is why, again, I could think of a pleasant drive years before to comfort myself. And I have no sense of direction. And now I can't figure out how to listen to music and my GPS at the same time. So I sing, sun's gonna shine on our back door someday. I can feel sizzle wincing in the back, but I sing anyway. Of course, I talk to her. Look, sizzle, the St. Louis Gateway Arch, a landmark I had always wanted to see, even if just from the car. And I can feel her reply in back of me. Yeah, Deb, where's the St. Louis Hotel? We don't stay in holiday inns because bringfido.com doesn't list them. And in the final rush to get out of town, I forget to pack my bathing suit. Missouri to Kansas. Look, Sizzle, the trees and grass are all covered with ice. Help, I can hear it faintly from the back. God, Sizzle. This road looks like Napoleon's retreat from Moscow without the snow. Do you think all those trucks off the road were driven by men? Ew, softness from the back. 
I'm careful about gas until the day I'm not. Leaving Winslow, Arizona, we have almost a full tank, and I think we've got enough to get to the next station. Well, we do. But what I remember of that drive is rocks and dirt and scrub brush and dirt and rocks as those little boxes in the gas gauge disappear. And my terror as the gauge is now blinking at me, furious, and I haven't seen a single human being. Until finally, like a mirage, appears a general store with two pumps, cash and carry, no cards. And as I'm paying the man, I make a weak joke about coasting in on my stupidity. And he says, well, if running out of gas is your worst problem, you're all right. We do visit our friends in Chicago, the Colorado Springs, and Albuquerque, and also in Boulder and Durango. We don't drive straight to the Pacific, but to our new home. I put Sizzle's be uh, bed out on the balcony, and she stretches out in the sun. It's February 15th, still winter, even in San Diego, and Sizzle insists that I keep the screen door open. So I wear a fleece jacket, not a bathing suit. I don't mind. Sizzle's been a brave dog for whole 11 years. And me, I just did the scariest thing in my life so far. Ready to change climates, to move where I had friends but no memories, and ready for one more adventure, these two old women pack up and drive west.